So guys, I think that we're going to start off then. Not that many people here, but uh, maybe someone will join us. Welcome to this uh, last breakout session for the day. So hopefully you had a cup of good cup of, cup of coffee. Uh, my name is uh, Jan Johansen. I'm SE manager for, for Nordics and Benelux. And uh, my foremost job in my daily life is to keep a team of 35 security engineers up to speed, ensure that they are skilled and have the right competences to also fight all the threats that we see and all the risks from, uh, from that are spreading from the internet. Today I will cover uh, some of the threats that we want to mitigate also for the uh, software-defined data centers and also how we can uh, control and manage the risk that we see from, uh, from the internet and also directly towards the, uh, the data centers. So uh, why focus on threats at all? and uh, what threats to focus at. I'll dive a little bit into that before we uh, discuss how we can deploy these solutions into uh, the data environment, the data center environment. And then finally, we'll also discuss a little bit about automation and uh, orchestration. Um, actually, before we start, I just want to share with you a brief announcement that actually came out five minutes ago, actually, uh, that we have more than one million Google accounts that actually have been breached by a new uh, threat that's called Gulligan. Uh, you can look it up afterwards, but it's uh, mainly targeted for Android phones for version 4 and 5 of the Android system. So you can look it up. Uh, if you combine the search for a Gulligan and, uh, and Checkpoint, then you will f be led directly into our website where we have actually uh, revealed this uh, very, very serious threat that uh, spreads and announced five minutes ago. But let's uh, continue with the presentation. So first of all, why focus on threats uh, as we see it uh, today? Uh, we know that all data, all applications, various types of devices, and also data centers are exposed to massive amounts of threats spreading out from the internet. Everything from, we have the, uh, the Trojan horses from hackers, from malware, and from various viruses that is spreading out and trying to infect in order to gain some benefit. These benefits are typically financially related or related to harvesting information, as we will see later on. So uh, in Checkpoint, but also other uh, companies like Cisco, like Verizon, are every year publishing a, a security report that actually states uh, what are the kind of the risks, what are the level of, uh, of um, infections that we should look at. And also from Checkpoint, we have uh, published this uh, report uh, that actually reveals a lot of details about what's going on in real businesses. These numbers here are actually from several thousands of live companies where we have not just doing a survey and a questionnaire, we have actually measured for longer periods of time all the threats that are getting through the existing security measures that we have in these organizations already. And from these numbers, we learned that a lot of organizations actually have and let in malicious code, like files uh, that can cause harm to the organization. Some of these files actually are being executed and also uh, create botnets. So three quarter of all companies that we actually did this investigation in, they have at least one botnet infected workplace in their organization. In some organizations, we find numerous fl different flavors of botnet even uh, spreading out in the uh, organization. And we know all the consequences of this, that we can have uh, create backdoors into the organization. We are doing uh, information harvesting. We can gain elevated access. We get access to resources that we ac definitely do not want the, uh, the bad guys to abuse from our organization. So uh, what we also have seen is that a lot of organizations have users that actually just install various applications. Applications that in some instances are not doing any harm, but in other instances actually can leak out confidential and internal information or can abuse the, uh, the installed security measures that you already have. I have just given some examples here. Hide my ass is an application that completely bypasses the existing security measures that we have in the organization. So if you have an established firewall, for instance, HiveMyAss will just encrypt any data uh, through the firewall to the internet, so we cannot 
control in any way or manage the information that your users have access to. Uh, I also mentioned other examples. Some of the most recent ones are definitely Dropbox. Uh, we, we see it as a harmless application because it's just a, like a, a, a cloud-based storage, but we have a lot of users who actually send and submit internal information, confidential information stored in the cloud uh, with no control of the access to, this, uh, to these cloud storage. So uh, we can have non-discoverable uh, applications in, exist in, in the security solutions. We may also introduce malware because we can have malware that is just passing through these applications and introduced into the, uh, into the organization without having any chance to, uh, to control and have a detection of the malicious content that we are having. We also see that uh, we have uh, data loss in many organizations. There can be many causes for this, but what we see is definitely a high percentage of unintentional leakage of information. So just an employee who just submits some information on Facebook, their Facebook uh, profile, or they may leak out information because they send to some wrong email recipient, uh, or we can have some by intention. We saw that, have seen that several times throughout this year. Uh, for instance, from whistleblowers who leak out in, uh, information intentionally from the organization, uh, or we can even have it via offline media by uh, different kinds. So this is a huge problem. We can see that almost 90% of all organizations where we actually uh, did this survey, uh, we had a con some kind of data loss uh, incident from the organization. So why focus on these threats from inside the data center? Big question. First of all, compromising the IT security is very attractive, especially where we see we have a high concentration of data. The more data we have concentrated, the more interested it is to harvest information, especially if it's related to some kind of transaction information. So uh, if we have something with credit cards involved, something with personal information, with uh, business development ideas, business market plans, etc., but also something like if you have huge capacity of storage or processing cap capabilities, if you are keeping secrets uh, for, uh, from your research or development department, or some in intellectual properties like patents or something like that, then you will be probably, if you are not already experienced that, then you will definitely experience some attack in the future. Because any company that is not already been, been hacked, it's because they have not discovered it yet, or they will be uh, nearby soon. So also this computing power and storage and bandwidth can be abused. So if you have huge data center capabilities, if someone can get inside, can abuse your storage, your uh, huge capacity of processing power, then it will be abused if possible. We've seen a huge evolution in this. From, from the very simple viruses, maybe some of you remember back in the, the I love you virus and Melissa virus, up to very, very complicated and complex uh, uh, threats we have today, where it's very, very difficult to discover the bad content, the malicious code, because it's newly created, so no one has a signature that matches, so we can catch it. So with all the conventional security stuff we have, like antivirus, like IPS, we cannot catch anything. I'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, with, especially within one area, what we call the zero day, or for instance, the ransomware is an example of zero day attacks. We had just from one year ago until March this, this year, actually, we had a huge growth. And of course, we have read in, in the news that there's a lot of uh, organizations and companies hit by this because they, they have lost a lot of amount of data that's been encrypted and lost, but this is just uh, one of the examples of where it had huge impact for some businesses. We have a lot more that is actually not revealed because organizations are not quite will willing to talk about uh, uh, where they have, have, have data breaches. So uh, this problem will only escalate. So why do we see now a bigger demand for focusing on data centers and securing the data centers than before. And when I say before, I mean, of course, at the times where we had dedicated servers, dedicated network uh, um, segments, where we have dedicated guys for taking care of the IT security, dedicated guys for taking care of the uh, server operations, and dedicated teams for taking care of the network, etc. So 
Today we have a raised uh, threat picture that is much more diverse than we had just a few years ago. On the other hand, we have much shorter provisioning cycles. And that's, of course, the whole idea in doing private clouds and public clouds and virtualized data centers. Because maybe 10 years ago, it took like eight months to deploy a new application, ensure that we had the network guys prepared, uh, setting it up correctly, uh, co configuring the firewalls and everything. Nowadays, it's a matter of days or even just hours from we decide that we want to deploy a new application till we have it completely deployed in the data center and it's ready to use by the users. So less interaction with the network and security teams because everything is integrated, so to say, in the, in the uh, data center. And in addition, we have also uh, applications and the data that are easily moving around with inside the data center. So it's very, very easy to make a clone of a system then started up in a complete different place in the data center, and maybe we didn't really consider how it should be connected network-wise or IT security-wise. So that's why we, it's, it's an area that is very important to focus at. The standard way we have in the, in the typical virtual envi environment is a standard firewall. What I will do now is I will differentiate between a standard firewall and a security gateway. A standard firewall is typically operating from layer 3 to layer 4. Security gateway operates from layer 2 to layer 7. So we have much, much broader uh, area of coverage from a security gateway that will cover much more functions. Today, a standard firewall will definitely not block any modern threat from the internet because we're just riding on open ports that we have to have open in order to communicate between, for instance, a server and a, a backend uh, database or whatever. So we can, we can, in the environment, we can configure very simple services, but the challenge is that they will not provide the, the more deep inspection parts of this, only the, the port-based security. We have no constant inspection, and we have no advanced security integration or automation. So we do auto segmentation, uh, or micro-segmentation, whatever we call it, uh, on the fly and as we work. So uh, let's take a little bit look at, a little look at, the, at the threats and the attack types uh, as we see today. I, I will cover these five threat types here. That's the main threats that we see today. Uh, first of all, we have the cyber attack group, which is uh, typically attacks that are formed from the internet from automatic services or from advanced hackers. The, um, the purpose of this is definitely to go for existing vulnerabilities in different services and applications and systems. So if we can find the flaw in a system, then we can abuse the system because we can you know, get a hook into the system and then we can abuse it and start you know, digging deeper into the organization systems. What we see is that cyber attacks typically going after uh, operating systems uh, towards uh, services and uh, also different applications where we have floors. Um, the second group is botnets. You're probably familiar with botnet. The, uh, the whole idea is that we have some servers that have been taken over by bad guys on the internet and as soon as they can squeeze a client into an organization, they have kind of a peer uh, relationship between the command and control server and the malicious client within the network. And then we can start doing with silent operation, that's the whole idea. It's very, very uh, difficult to discover that we have actually an infected user place inside our organization that starts communicating with the uh, command and control server outside. And then when a certain signal occurs from the server to the client, it starts doing the best stuff, like collecting information from the, from the internal network, from the data centers, from the applications on the data centers, uh, or starting an attack, spreading its malware to other systems, or starting uh, denial of service attacks, or spreading spam, et cetera, et cetera. That's the whole idea behind uh, botnets. But the idea is that they're very, very quiet before they are told to start up uh, and, and starting up their activities. Another group is, is known malware. Known malware is all the viruses and the worms that you already know. We have very good te te technologies today to catch this, but one of the disadvantages with the malware is that we need to have a known signature before we can catch it and 
prevent it or block it. Fourth group is the leakage. I already mentioned that. We have information leakage out, leaking, leaking out from the internal organization for many, many reasons. Unintentional by users who don't you know, use their mind and, and, and think over what they're doing. Or we can have intentional behavior where actually an insider wants to leak out information uh, to some ex external party. And then finally, a huge group that we have seen is very, very important today, which we call the zero-day threats. Zero-day threat is a threat we cannot catch with any one of these technologies because it's unknown. It's, it's taking advantage of flaws in the systems that no one knows about, not even the vendor yet. So we have a small window of time where we can utilize the systems and these, these vulnerabilities in the system before it's discovered and can be catched by an IPS signature or a, a, a virus, antivirus signature that can block it. So it's undetectable via uh, standard signature-based technologies. So let's try to see what, the, what kind of countermeasures can we deploy in order to, uh, to deal with these uh, kind of attacks. The cyber attacks, the, base, the, the best system we have to, to uh, mitigate that is IPS systems, intrusion prevention systems. And luckily today, we have efficient systems. Most of our colleagues on the market uh, providing firewall, providing a firewall called Next Generation Firewall, NGFW, which means that it already includes a very good IPS system. Uh, the P stands for prevention, which means it's being blocked on its way in. So this is very efficient. It's based on signatures. It sometimes also covers attacks like DDoS attacks and other attacks that are directed towards, for instance, the, uh, the plug-in in our browsers. So they are very efficient, very fast systems, these IPS systems. The downside is that they cannot handle the zero-day attacks because they don't, know, they don't have a signature for it yet. Next group is the botnet. The botnet is actually we have a bot anti-botnet technology that discovers the communication between the malicious workplace and the peer, the command and control server on the internet. So we can detect the, spe the special pattern of traffic that flows between the client and the command and control server, and then we can block it. We cannot yet clean up the workplace, but we can block the communication and stop the malicious behavior, and then we can alert the administrator and say, hey, let, hey, we have an infected user here, you should clean, clean it up uh, immediately. And ours, well-known technology that is, again, very fast. As soon as we, we have a signature, we can block uh, the malicious uh, code uh, with, uh, with a very, very short time. And then we have uh, data loss prevention to prevent the leakage of information from our internal network. There are different technologies here. One, some of the technologies that exist on the market, they rely on a kind of a fingerprinting. So we have to classify all the internal information, put some kind of a fingerprint so we can detect if this kind of information is leaking out. So if I have, a, for instance, a, a file server in the HR department, and I want to prevent that all the salary uh, lists are leaking out, I can put a fingerprint on it, so if it passes through the, my gateway, I can take, oh, now I have a file passing through that actually is fingerprinted, I have to block it. The way Checkpoint worked with this is to actually use the characteristics of the data content. So for instance, we can detect and block any information that is leaking out that looks like, for instance, a uh, health record or uh, the personal in, uh, social security number, a passport number, driver's license number, any type of data that we can describe. And we can even do, uh, let's say, some kind of advanced data detection. So for instance, for uh, the Danish CPR number, the social security number, we can do a modulus 11 calculation on the number to ensure that it's actually a social security number, that it's not something a number that is just, I know that, that they are out uh, because the modulus 11 is not uh, valid any longer, but we can do such kind of uh, calculations. Thanks, Andy. Um, and also, I just want to mention this, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, will hit, us ev will hit everyone, all the companies in, in, the, uh, in the EU, EU at least, uh, in 2018, and it will have a lot of focus on data leakage and data encryption. So it will be huge the next one and a half year to have a focus on, uh, on leaking uh, data. 
Finally, uh, the zero day. We have technologies today based on typically uh, sandbox technologies. So in Checkpoint, we call it Sandblast. That's our trademark for a sandboxing technology. But we have bundled other technologies together with a sandboxing technology. Because sometimes sandbox technology can be circumvented. So we have some technologies that can cheat that, OK, if I'm executed in a sandboxing environment, I'm not executing at all. So I'm just hiding myself until I can see I'm in a real user's environment. And then I execute and, uh, and will uh, det uh, detonate myself. So we have some technologies that actually can countermeasure with it. So we have a very, very high rate of detecting uh, malicious content, zero day content that is riding in with traffic into our network. We can never reach 100%, unfortunately not. But those uh, colleagues on the market that say they can, they can keep up with 100% IT security don't, don't believe them because it's not possible. But we are very close to 100%. Um, this is kind of definitely a competing factor, this. So I would say that currently we are like 99.6% or something like that. We will never reach 100%, but the more close we get, of course, the better uh, we do. OK, so how can we deploy these technologies in the, in the virtual environment? <clears throat> so let's look into the cooperation and the partnership between VMware and Checkpoint. And actually, with the, with the introduction of NSX, we have much, much better capabilities of integrating with these threat prevention technologies and, so to say, to enable them into the virtual environment. So in Checkpoint, we have made firewalls for 23, 24 years, something like that. And what you see in Checkpoint is that it's the same technology that is being utilized in all environments. So whenever we're talking about a small office, we're talking about a huge enterprise network, or we're talking about data centers or cloud, it's the same basic uh, firewall technology that is deployed in the kernel. Then we have, of course, bundled it together with uh, like features integrating with NSX, integration with Cisco ACI, integration with AWS, Amazon, integrating with Azure, integrating with Google Drive. So you can have the very same management system, the very same core kernel code that actually exists across all the different environments and managing everything from the same console that I'll show a little bit later. So, so VSEC actually is a brand name for Checkpoint Gateway in virtual environment. V for virtual, of course, and SEC for security. So virtual security is the, the brand name for, uh, for, for the uh, for gateway, security gateway in virtual environment. So what are the components in this? This is a standard virtual environment with different machines on the top of a hypervisor. Uh, what we'll do is, of course, we'll deploy the Checkpoint Smart Center, which is a security management system that is basic. Whenever we are managing kind of uh, endpoint devices, uh, small dedicated security gateways or firewalls, or we are managing enterprise edge gateways, or we are managing um, the uh, security gateways in the virtual environment, we're using the very same platform. So we can deploy the same policy across the whole organization with a minimal of overhead in the work we have to do with uh, policies and all the configuration. So this is the way it works. When we deploy a security gateway on one system, it will apply the policy to all the systems. So as we'll see a little bit later, we will have automatic deployment of new VSEC instances every time we add a new host. But the whole idea here is that we basically protect each individual application system with a personal firewall, personal gateway. <clears throat> so the auto deployment works the way that if I already have told my vCenter, whenever new member you get of this cluster, you should deploy the VSEC agent on the new member or the new host of this cluster and apply the policy that applies to the existing systems. So whatever VMware system um, we have here operating on top of the hypervisor is moving around, it will be protected by the same security policy as we decided from the management system we saw before. It integrates with the NSX manager and talks directly both with the vCenter 
and the NSX manager and deploys uh, seamlessly into this environment. So the idea is, of course, to deploy the east-west uh, traffic inspection between the systems. So if I have one VM system here talking to another VM system, then I have decided a security policy that applies to exact this system or this group of systems we have here, talking to this group of systems or this specific system we have here. Everything is based on dynamic objects, which means that I can change the IP addresses, I can move the systems around. Every time I have a defined a group, this group and at, at any member that it resides within this group will be protected with the same policy. So I can migrate a system to another host, I can migrate it to another cluster, and uh, the policy can be applied across uh, the whole environment. So um, based on the security rules that first of, first of all will determine what kind of traffic can flow between these systems. But on top of, of the ports and the protocols and the services that is granted to flow between the systems, I will do full constant inspection. So all the technologies I showed you before, the IPS technology, the anti-bot technology, the, the data leakage prevention technology, the antivirus technology, and the zero-day technology will apply to content inspection of all the content that is flowing inside the uh, virtual uh, architecture. And that's actually what shows here. So we have some uh, policy applied to this one that, for instance, could include all this kind of uh, technologies I just mentioned. So we will constant inspect and immediately detect and prevent spreading of a virus or some malicious code that already have infected one system here and prevent any other system from being infected by this, by just um, block the content that flows uh, in the virtual switching environment uh, in, the, um, in the virtual uh, data center. Unified management. As I mentioned, we have the same management system that takes care of the policies, the security policies across the whole, uh, whole organization, including the data center and the cloud-based uh, implementation that we may also have. So it works for the physical gateways, it works for the private cloud, and it works across the private and the public uh, cloud, if that's what we want to do. Application-aware policies. That means that I'm working with the dynamic objects, as I mentioned before. So I don't, I don't define IP addresses and very technical information. I rely on the information already configured into the NSX manager or the vCenter. So I pull the information from vCenter and pull information from the NSX manager and act upon this. And the standard timer for, uh, for, this, for these values are updated every 30 seconds. So maximum up to 30 seconds after I have changed the configuration here, the gateways in the, in the uh, virtual environment will know about the changes for hosts or, or virtual machines that change parameters, change position, whatever, uh, in the virtual environment. <clears throat> um, so this is exactly how a policy looks in a checkpoint setup. So I don't have to do any more changes from the security manager. Now I can do the changes from here, where I usually do the configuration when I'm moving around systems or creating new systems, apply new servers to the web virtual machine group or whatever. Shared context, context policies. What it means here is actually if I have and detect an infected system, I not only prevent the infected system to spread the malware to other systems. That will be prevented in the VSEC gateway. So the VSEC gateway will detect, okay, I have a malware or a zero day that is actually trying to spread from this system to other systems. What we'll do next is actually we will send a signal back to the NSX manager and tell this system has to be quarantined. So we will put it in quarantine so that it is not possible to communicate inside or outside from this system before an administrator have taken responsibility and said, okay, we have a system here, we need to clean it up before it's put back into operation. Actually, I can also mention here that the way it works with VSEC is that 
you can decide when you deploy VSAC to deploy it in a disabled, with a disabled policy, which means that if any object, if any virtual machine inside the virtual environment has not been defined in NSX, it will not communicate either to the internet or to the internal network or to the DMZ zone. It will completely be isolated network-wise until someone takes a decision and said, okay, it has to be attached to this group and then it starts to open up the communication uh, inside the, the network. So we can decide to deploy this in kind of a enabled mode or disabled mode. And standard deployment will definitely be disabled mode, which means someone has to take a decision of what kind of communication is going back and forth to this uh, system. Okay, uh, just before uh, wrapping this up, um, I just want to uh, promote a little bit what a service that we have in Checkpoint that's called Security Checkup. So maybe today you consider all these threats, are there any chance that I could have someone flowing around in my network that I do not want to have? Do I already have infected user, user machines or workplaces? Do I already have servers in my data center that may be infected with some uh, malicious code, something that is running hidden in the background, we have a way actually of detecting this. What we do is actually we provide and we do this for free uh, for any uh, yeah, Checkpoint Prospect customer. We put up a box and we can collect information fully uh, non-intrusive. So we put up a box and put it on a monitor port or into the, a tab in the data center and then we feed in, in the information and doing all the analysis like we were sitting in the network. So we're analyzing the packets, we're looking for malicious content, we're looking for botnet infections, we're looking for data that leaks out, we're looking for malware, we're looking for bad applications or URLs that are introduced, for instance, by the users. So we can cover both the mobile users, the corporate users, and also all the traffic to and from the data center. And after like a week or two weeks, what we do is actually we create a security report to your fully uh, uh, information. So you can see what kind of information do I have in my network? Do I have any threats today, any risks I should in some way manage or control? So like malware downloads, we have uh, real cyber attacks, attacks that is directed towards web servers, mail servers, or other kind of uh, services that you offer in your, in your network botnet infections, high-risk applications, get a full list of all the applications that any user have seen and used in the network. So very, very broad scope of uh, information you get from this report. And of course, afterwards, you can take your decisions if you want to continue the, the talk with Checkpoint or talk to someone else to how to uh, mitigate and, uh, and work with these uh, threats. I'm almost uh, done. But I just want to uh, wrap up that what is very important is to keep this micro-segmentation in mind, very important. Uh, the VSEC ensures that we have full micro-segmentation into the smallest virtual machine in the network. Fully micro-segmentation, including all constant inspection between traffic that flows to and from uh, every virtual machine. We were able to compartmentalize any system that seems to be, have been attacked by some malicious service. Uh, so we can isolate it completely from the rest of the virtual machine so it will not make any more harm. We are able to detect and prevent the leakage of any confidential data. So we can configure your data types that you use in your company. So if you're working with some internal files, if you have some like uh, uh, financial books or something like that, that is very internal we can detect any kind of information. I can even detect, for instance, on the, uh, on the headers in a document, so my PowerPoint presentation can be discovered and blocked when it's trying to be submitted outside the network because we react based on the headers or the footers or some kind of a, a watermark inside a, a, a document. Also, what it ensures, of course, if you have Checkpoint already in your organization, it's very easy to deploy VSEC in the, in the uh, data center environment because it's the same management system, just add, have to add a virtual uh, gateway, security gateway. Um, but also, as I mentioned, in the public cloud, 
we are seamlessly integrating with, uh, with Amazon so we can deploy uh, VSEC also in the, uh, in the public uh, cloud environment. And finally, uh, the management system, I haven't had much time to talk about this, but the management system actually interfaces with all modern um, orchestration systems and automation systems, so we can issue commands. For instance, via CLI, we can issue commands via, via the uh, RESTful uh, API, so we can automate the process of launching a new security gateway from an orchest orchestration system. So don't even need to have a hands-on the, the checkpoint security management system. It can also, also everything can be uh, provisioned from the orchestration system if that's what you want. As mentioned, we integrate with NSX, we integrate with Cisco ACI. Actually, we also integrate with ICE, Cisco ICE technology. So if you already have that in your organization, we can also integrate with that. Uh, we integrate with the very soon in Q1. We'll integrate with, Duke, with the Google Cloud. We have for several years been work, uh, working together with uh, Amazon and with the Microsoft on Azure and AWS. So we always support these systems. So uh, all the technologies, actually, we also have other partners like Arista that we also had here today uh, to integrate into their orchestration and automation environments. Uh, we launched the security management system earlier this year. So we have all the latest technology into integration in orchestration systems. So I think uh, you will have a really hard time to find uh, more automated systems than the Checkpoint IT security management system. And of course, the dynamic scalability so we can, uh, we can attach and we can also decide in a, from a dynamic pool how many resources you provide for the VSEC gateways. So we can have a dynamic way of allocating more vCPUs or vCores to the different vSEC systems. So for instance, if you today have a requirement for 15 vCores to handle the, the load that you have in the data center, and tomorrow you need to scale up, then you can add to the pool. So you can have, for instance, 25 uh, vCores that can be spread around the different uh, vSEC instances you have in the virtual environment. OK, final slide. If you want to have a uh, Christmas tree, you can get one for free by filling out one of the forms we have at the booth. So uh, visit our booth outside and, uh, and uh, get one of the Christmas trees that we have. So any uh, questions here before we uh, end up the session? Any comments? Yeah. It's a good question. What we do actually is if we, we deploy different technologies, first of all, we have a huge, huge list of blacklisted DNS and IP addresses. So that's the first thing we look at for. That's traffic from a client to some kind of blacklisted service outside. Secondly, we look to the pattern of the data. Typically, it's encrypted traffic, and it's encrypted with a standard that we cannot decrypt. So this is a second sign that, OK, this is traffic between a, an internal client that doesn't look like valid traffic, it's not legal traffic, and then secondly, we look to the pattern, like it's encrypted with a standard that is not X509 or something like that, standard-based. It's, it's like a private, a private uh, or proprietary encryption. And then secondly, we also have a um, pattern match for different types of pattern for known botnets. In fact, we know a lot of these uh, SUS and botnets, for instance, that we can say immediately, OK, this is SUS, so we block it immediately. So we have three different technologies, actually, where we detect the, uh, the botnet uh, traffic that's going on. And then we block the traffic. OK, I have one scenario. Yeah. Uh, for example, I go to this whatever I like uh, uh, images.com. I upload totally legit looking fetish to me. Yeah. But uh, when you look with the stenography, there is yeah. something commanded. Yes, I know it is. Yeah, I'm familiar with this technology. Actually, our sandblast, our sandboxing technology, deploys an additional technology that is outside of the sandbox, the conventional sandbox technology. That's called the uh, CPU level detection. From the Intel chipset, 
we have a debug output where we can actually detect if you have code execution that is, is very technically it's called return oriented programming that is typically used with the stenography example you mentioned so we can detect already when the malicious code st starts coming into the organization even before the JPEG picture is being downloaded so at a very early stage, we can detect and we can block. So you can never reach to a, 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 a state where you actually can download the JPEG picture and start you know, decrypting the content and you know, create some malicious code inside. But, but even if it cannot be done on a network level? We can, do it, we can do it on a desktop level and on a network level. And in the, vir in, in the virtual environment as well. And in the Office 365 actually also. Yeah. Somebody's using on the spy. Or are, are you safety? Maybe I use uh, some uh, hacker on DNS yeah. to do. Uh, uh, and if I do it, that, that way or that server, that nobody has done before, mm. it is practically impossible to, yeah. to uh, rule out or rule check. As I said, we have a very, very high detection rate, but it's not 100%. You will always be able to find some sneaky ways around where you can circumvent. But, of course, Next month, we have a technology that, that will mitigate the technology that they just used yesterday. So, you know, it's a mouse race, uh, mouse cat race all the time. But so far, we're able to catch a very, very high rate also of the stenography rate, uh, rate threats that we see uh, coming uh, pretty, pretty uh, much right now. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, full correct. And uh, like you mentioned before in your report, there are almost one million uh, new models each mm. day, so yes. nobody can keep up with the signature. No. Oh, oh. Signature is. Uh, you can say that the 95 percent of the known attacks today will be catched by signature-based technologies like IPS and antivirus. But the rest of it is completely new technologies that will circumvent any signature-based technology. And that's why we need technologies like the sand, uh, sandboxing technologies that will take at least a part of the rest of the five percenters. So I agree with you. It's, it's not easy, but we, we try to catch them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, you also have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, when you said the uh, rule is need to do from machine, for example, you know, you like to open that SSH yeah. port and stuff like that. I would like to know if there is a liar sudden uh, inspection or just liar key. So just open the door, you do do server without making inspection inside the bugger and understand if it's a real SSH traffic to do to go. Yeah. It's up to you. So uh, depending on the configuration, you can, you can allow traffic between any port, any service. So it's up to you to how to configure and how tight you want to, to put the bands. If you have an application that actually chains port number, uh, but same service, then we can configure the, the, the uh, gateway to handle this kind of connections. So basically we can, you know, depending on your demand, we can configure it anyway. Of course, we have some uh, challenges in if you have want to inspect encrypted traffic. Exactly. Yeah, when we, because then we need to you know do the certificate stuff where we decrypt based on the certificates. And if you use some kind of proprietary encryption algorithm, as I men mentioned before, we have always had challenges with, for instance, Skype, because Skype is using except for the latest one. Yes, exactly. yes, one yes. Awesome. And and for that, we can detect the type of traffic, and then you can decide if you want to allow it or block it but we cannot inspect the content of the yeah. message. Uh, I got some experience about that. And, uh, yeah. In most cases, when you enable this type, type of inspection, mm. you got some performance problems yeah. because you have to inspect every single packet, especially when you do direct TCP traffic. Yes, like that. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, so in this instance, yeah, we can block it, but we cannot do it. Deep. You cannot detect, for instance, what kind of traffic flow you have. You have a file exchange, whatever. No, we cannot do that, but we can but allow it or block it. Uh, 
Yeah. Or that or like also because if they share the files, mm. then it's almost impossible like that. Yeah. Just, it's random. Exactly. And, and of course you have to obtain a deep inspection. Mm. And then at the same time you have some problem with the uh, print uh, because of course. Uh, yeah. Exactly, full agree. So you ha it's up to you to decide, can we allow anyone to communicate via Skype yeah. and have the, the leakage problem, for instance? And if not, then you have to block it completely. Like okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else, or? How free was the free chat bot before? Uh, it's free, yeah. You can book it uh, outside at the booth, so just sign up for it, yeah. Right. Completely, you don't have to sign anything that you accept that if you want a mutual, uh, like a, uh, what do you call it, a uh, agreement that we will not share any information, we can sign that with no problem. We can even keep the hot drive with you so you can be sure that we will not spread anything. But uh, yes, it's completely so free. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Nice. Thanks. Thanks.